The other day I posted a video where you saw this Olin's fork on the front of my Ibis Ripmo, and a bunch of you were excited to hear if I would do a review. Today is your lucky day. Today we're gonna to talk about the Olin's RXF 36M2 fork. <laughs> I want to give a big thanks to my friends over at Jensen USA. They made this video possible. Thanks guys, appreciate it. Jensen is a leading online retailer in the United States for Olin's suspension products. And I've got a link in the description below over to Jensen's website where you can check out all the latest Olin stuff, including this RXF 36 M2 fork we're talking about today. Beyond Jensen, I am proudly supported by my friends at Industry9, p Components, and Shimano. Now, I have received a couple of things, no cost, from Fox in the last year. I don't have like a formal relationship with Fox, so I'm not like officially sponsored, but I just wanna let you know that I do have that relationship going on in the background. I've really enjoyed the Olins, I love my Fox stuff, and I think there's some unique places where the Olins beats the Fox and where the Fox might win out. So listen to the end for the whole nitty gritty. A quick overview of the RXF 36M2. So this is a 36 mil stanchion trail fork. When it came, it was set up at 170 mils of travel, which I used on my little Ripmo over there. I have since changed the travel down to 160 millimeters, and I'll walk you through how to do that in just a few moments. It's a very easy process. Over here on the left side of the bike, we've got the low speed compression, the high speed compression, and the low speed rebound adjust. This fork is a 44 mil offset. It's also available in a 51. If you have a choice, go for the 44, but honestly, you can get away with either offset and most folks won't notice the difference. It's not that big of a deal. So right here is the air cartridge. Up top, we have the main air chamber. And then there's a negative air chamber down here that is automatically balanced. There's a transfer port in there. And I know there's some patent things that other brands have, so I don't know how they have their transfer port thing solved, but it seems to work just fine. And then down below, you can adjust the bottom out resistance, kind of like the progressivity with the volume tokens in the other guy's forks. I did purchase this fork with my own money, though since I am working with Jensen, I'm not paying quite full retail pop. I also purchased the air cartridge as well. So I've got a couple rides on the Olins before today, and I'm still trying to get the thing set up. Right now, the number one thing I want to say about that fork is that it rides really high in the travel. The Fox forks, I'm used to them and the fact that I can set one up without almost even riding it and usually it's like ballpark. After I think three rides on the Olins, I've still got a ways to go to get the setup dialed in. It's, it feels notably different than the Fox. Logan and I have both hit this root to step up feature before, and it's pretty darn harsh. So I think it's gonna be fun to slide the suspension O-rings all the way down on both the fork and the shock. So let's watch closely and see if we're bottoming out on the takeoff or coming close to it. Leave a comment if you see the O-ring move less or more than you were expecting. You ready? All right. Ooh, we have to watch the slow-mo back. Oh, cool. I was gonna ask if you saw my sweet lanyard. Logan claims this test does not count because I apparently altered my takeoff and did a lanyard. I had no intentions of doing a lanyard until I was in the air. And then I was landing, and I was like, oh, I could just pull back on the landing and do a little wheelie, sweet. But look, we didn't use as much travel as I thought we would. This fork is a lot more supportive than the Fox unit, and I don't have the ramp chamber super pressurized. I gotta double check, but I think there's only 150 or 160 PSI in the ramp chamber. I'm at the very, I'm just under the bottom end of what they recommend for my weight range. So this fork rides real high in the travel. That makes me think it would be a really good fork for a bike that you're trying to get to be more aggressive and to slack out a little bit. We didn't bottom out back here, but you guys saw that sweet lanyard. That's why everything worked out. Currently, small button sensitivity isn't the best, nor is it the worst. With the damper, if I put in 
two or three clicks of low speed compression, it starts to feel a little bit firmer than I want. So I've been running the low speed all the way open. I tried one click of high speed and the fork's already riding so tall that I didn't really need more support. So I turned the high speed back off. One thing I talk about a lot in these videos is bike balance. You don't want the front of your bike to feel drastically different than the rear. The Olin's fork has a very different feel than the Fox fork. However, it was a pretty darn good match to the Fox Flow X2 rear shock. At the same time, I honestly do prefer the DPX2 over the X2, even with the Cascade Components Link, which I'm riding in most of these shots here. I ended up removing just a little bit more air from the bottom out chamber and then also went to a tad firmer overall pressure. I did bottom the fork out quite a few times, but did not have a big issue with harsh bottoming. Here in the Northwest, traction's pretty low and I'm not looking for a racer setup, I'm looking for a traction setup. So I really enjoy running a tad softer front end than I would have a few years ago when I was still racing. And then I enjoy the extra traction. Fox units I've been riding have a little bit more open feel. Often I'm running one or two or three, maybe five clicks of damping, either high speed or low speed. On the Olins, I'm running it fully open. And it's still a tad slower moving than what I'm used to. Is this a huge deal? No, but it's definitely not quite the same feel as the Fox. And if you're any lighter than me, I think you'd be better served with a different brand of fork. However, if you're any heavier than me at my 170 pounds, this could be a really good option for you. Once the fork is indeed moving, it's got extremely good sensitivity. It's weird to describe, the air spring works fantastic, it's just the damping is a little bit heavier than I'd like. While I've ridden Ibis Ripmos for a couple of years now, I'm very familiar with them, and I do genuinely like the stock geometry. I wish it was a tad slacker, so I ran this fork at 170 mils of travel. With having a couple of mountain bikes at my disposal, I really wanted to get nerdy and get into this fork and try a few new things. So. I figured it would be pretty smart to try this thing on a couple of my other bikes. However, those other bikes require a 160 millimeter travel, so I would need to be lowering the travel down to 160 from the 170 you've been watching up until this point. The first bike I was going to try it on would be the Yeti SB130 Lunchride. But before we get the fork on there, let's go ahead and throw in that shorter air cartridge and shorten the whole fork up. In order to swap the travel of your RX F36, you're going to need a new air cartridge. I've got a link to these over at Jensen in the description down below. One thing about the Olin's fork that's a little different than the Fox and kind of cool is you don't need to pull the lowers in order to change the travel with the new air cartridge. You just unbolt the air cartridge at the bottom and then at the top and you pull it right out, throw in the new one. Try your 14 millimeter. Oh, we're going to try a 14 millimeter socket. Oh, we're going to try a 14. Oh, we're gonna try a 14. Almost. Oh, if I wiggle it. Oh, finally. We'll try a 14 mil socket to loosen this thing up. That's right, it's really tricky to find a socket that'll fit between the dropout and the actual nut. No go with any of the hardened impact style drivers. I have a Moto T handle right here I like to use for this, but it does fit. Torque spec is not through the moon because this is an aluminum foot nut. Stock, the Olin's fork uses a gold top cap for the air spring. I use this Fox one because it fits better with the Motion Instruments data acquisition device. A really cool thing about this setup is it just uses a cassette lock ring tool to remove the whole air cartridge. Never use power tools when working on bicycles. And here we go. Okay, now let's install our new air cartridge. Olin's does specify using their own proprietary fork oil for the oil bath. Now, I don't have Olin's oil. You can order Olin's oil through Jensen USA. I don't happen to have any here. I will link to the oil at Jensen in the description below. I'm gonna substitute with Fox 20 weight gold oil. Let's see how this thing does on the trail. Ready to rock. So you'll notice, hopefully immediately, there's a device mounted up to the right side fork leg. That right there is my Motion Instruments data acquisition device. This syncs up with my phone and then it takes a reading of how fast and how often the fork is compressing. We can then use this data to understand how exactly this fork is working. In the back of the SB130, I am running a Cascade Components link. This helps add a little bit more sensitivity to the top of the stroke and provides just a touch more bottoming resistance, but it shouldn't affect the fork feel a whole lot. Or will it? Let's sync up all of our devices. Excellent. 
Before we look at the actual data that we recorded, let's go ahead and show you what the fork sensor is essentially doing. Notice that on general riding, the fork's moving quite a bit, and then you can see whenever I do a wheelie, the graph stops moving and bottoms out, and then when I'm in corners even, the fork does get pretty deep into the travel. That was a good corner. It's super fun to watch the live view here, but it doesn't actually record this data. So I did a bunch more riding and recorded the data on those, and we can go ahead and look at the numbers. I bounced these numbers off of the CEO of Motion Instruments, and he confirmed that the numbers look pretty ballpark. Maybe just a touch slower than a lot of the EWS guys are using, but not totally out of left field. This is good to know. Olin's is clearly on the right track with this fork, and I think for heavier riders, they're gonna love this thing. I will say I did enjoy the fork more on the Yeti SB130 than I did on the Ritmo. The Yeti is about three quarters of a degree steeper in head tube angle, so there's more weight on the front end. I think that's helping me enjoy this fork just a little bit more on the Yeti. Going back and forth between the Fox and the Olens, you know, it's the jury's out. They both have their reasons. I like the Fox for its all around openness. It's simple. I'm more familiar with it so I can set it up faster. But then I do like the Olens. If I'm gonna go ride something more bike parky, I can indeed make the bike ride a little higher in the travel and that could be really nice. After I got the fork mounted up to the Evil Offering V2, I took a moment, stepped back, and I felt like a proud parent sending my kid off to school for the first day. It seemed like I'd finally found the right fit. I'd done the right thing. This evil had finally grown up and found its match. Just look at it, it looks sweet. Well, I'm stoked to get the fork on this bike because it's pretty easy to set it up to ride higher in the stroke. The offering is a good bike, but with the stock 144, it's a 66.8 head tube angle, and I haven't ridden the 66.8 head tube angle since about 2012. Luckily, we have technology here in 2021, and this can be overcome. In the initial Evil Offering review video, I talked about how I really enjoy going up to a 160 air sprung fork after riding the 150 coil fork. That helped quite a bit. Then I added a one degree angle set. That helped even more. And now I put the cherry atop this black ice cream sundae. On the offering, I continued to use the Motion Instruments data acquisition device. Once again, Rob from Motion Instruments was nice enough to collaborate a little bit and give me some direct feedback on my numbers. Yes, it's quite within the ballpark for most EWS folks. So that means the fork is on paper set up pretty darn well on the offering. Now, how is trail feel? Well, you know, I think in hindsight, I might have enjoyed the fork a little bit more on the Yeti. It's hard for me to say exactly why. Perhaps when it's ridden a little bit higher in the stroke, it is a touch more harsh. Uh, that might be a hypothesis, but it might be real. It's hard to say. I did notice on my Instagram when I asked about this fork, feedback was quite mixed. We had some big lovers and some folks that weren't quite as fun. I think that's coming down to personal preference and also to body type. If you are bigger, oh. this would make a lot more sense. I'm gonna continue riding this fork on the offering and in the updated long-term ride review video, I'll give you some more feedback of what I'm thinking about the fork because I'm intending to keep this fork on here for a while. If you're looking for a new suspension fork and you don't want to go with one of the mainstream brands, then definitely consider Olin's. The product is high quality and it has a lot of cool features that even the bigger brands haven't caught on to yet. Is it for everyone? Probably not. It's going to take longer to set up than one of the bigger brand forks, but for the right person, this is a really incredible fork. If you want to learn more about this fork, I have a link to it in the description below. And anything you purchase while you're at Jensen USA will also directly help support my channel. If you enjoyed this video, please hit that red subscribe button down below. And don't forget to leave a comment about that O-ring and if it moved more or less than you were expecting. With that, I'm off to the trails. So thanks for watching.